Good morning. Welcome, everyone. A little feedback just to get us going. Uh, my name is Justin, and uh, we're in this series right now called The Disciple, or Disciple, and, and it's a series where we're just looking at uh, what does it mean to follow Jesus, and today the topic that we are going to be looking at is how do we follow Jesus in the way that we approach conflict, conflict. Uh, as I was thinking about this week, um, there was a show that, that I watched recently, and there was an episode of this show where uh, the entire episode was just one conflict after another, right? And it happened to be a family dinner. It was, yeah, yeah that never happens, right? It was a family dinner. It was actually a, a Christmas celebration. All the family was together, extended family, everyone's together, right? And it's this show called The Bear. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, I won't, I'll try not to give anything away, but, but basically this, this it's, it, it's tense, and everybody knows the conflict is coming, but everyone's approaching it a little different way. Some people are avoiding it. Uh, other people are, are kind of just smooth it over. Then there's the other people in the room that are kind of feeding the conflict a little bit. Other ones that are just diving head in, right? They're, and then there's some that they are the conflict, right? Um, and everyone is ready, waiting for it to explode. And, uh, and it just reminded me uh, of, unfortunately, sometimes that's the way family gatherings tend to be like, Right? Have you ever had a family gathering that you set it up, you're like, man, this is going to be incredible, but then things happen. And it's not just family gatherings, things happen at work, things happen even at church. Conflict, and it just sometimes happens, and, and the truth of the matter is, is that all of us, we approach it a little bit differently, don't we? Not everyone approaches it the same way. And, and a lot of you, you learn how to approach conflict from your families. That's how you did, right? So as we're starting this off, I want you to think about that. How do you approach conflict? In a good way to maybe evaluate how you approach conflict is look back, how does your family approach conflict? You know, some families, it tends to be more of something that you avoid, right? That, that you don't really deal with conflicts very much. You kind of push them aside. If you have to deal with them, you do. But some conflicts are more characterized by avoiding. Some, it's just smooth it over. You spot the conflict, and you say it's there, but you kind of just cover it up as fast as you can. My, con my family was a little bit more direct, kind of loud, right? That was just, that's just the way that I was raised. And so, little more, you just talk. You did, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even Italian, but people would have thought we have an Italian family, by the way, that we talk to each other. Like, we just go at it. Or some families, like, sometimes you have the people, too, that maybe like to instigate the conflict. I have a little bit of that in me, too, sometimes. Like, I don't necessarily want to be in it, but I don't mind sitting back and adding to the fire and just watching it go. But all of us, we approach conflict just a little bit differently. And I want you to think about that. I want you to think about how you approach conflict because how you approach conflict is important because you're going to experience a lot of it in life. But yet it's not something that we talk about very often. It's not a subject of school. You got maths and conflict class, right? No, you don't have that. But yet it's something that you experience almost every single day. So today we're going to talk about it. And the reason why is because Jesus talked about it. Jesus talked about it loads. He taught about conflict. And you may, it might, it might surprise you a little bit. Jesus, who's all about peace, he actually taught a ton about conflict. And Jesus was like the master of conflict. And so whenever we have approached this series, it's all about following Jesus, right? And we said from the very beginning, for a lot of people, a Jesus follower, a Christian, it's just like a fan. Like they wear the T-shirt, you know, they, they click the box on Facebook. But that's not the same thing as being a disciple, being a disciple means that we actually follow him, and today we're going to look, about, look at what it means to actually follow him when it comes to this topic of conflict, because it's actually something that Jesus cares a lot about, and it's something that he talked a lot about. See, Jesus, he would say things like this, do not suppose that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. And then he goes on to warn that a lot of the conflict that you're going to face is in your family. No one here experiences family conflict, right? And, and he says that when you experience family conflict, you're going to have a choice. You're going to have to decide whether you're going to follow him or you're going to follow your own way of approaching it, right? And, and he's, he wants people to follow him, and, and he's, he's warning them that they're going to need to learn that. He'd also say things like this, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. That sounds like fun. 
Um, Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. you got to be on your guard because you're going to be handed over to local councils, flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. So Jesus, he knew we were going to face conflict. In fact, sometimes following Jesus means you're going to face a little bit more conflict, (laughs) not necessarily less. But his plan, and you can see it clearly in that little passage, is that, that he wants people to be good representatives of his way of approaching conflict. But yet, a lot of Christians, they don't even look at Jesus' approach to conflict. They don't try to mimic it. They say, oh, I follow Jesus. He's the master. But is he the master of conflict? See, whenever we learn from him how to approach conflict, because you're going to experience it. You're going to experience it in local community groups. <laughs> you're going to experience it at work, Right? I was talking with somebody this week about some of the conflicts that they experience at work, and they have a real opportunity to be what? A witness, a representative for Jesus that shines out and shows people the way that he does things is different. This verse even tells us you're going you're gonna to find conflict at church. <laughs> How many of you have experienced some good old-fashioned church conflict? Yeah, it's not always pretty. <laughs> you're going to experience it, but do you follow him? Do you represent him in the way that you approach conflict? See, Jesus says this, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, though, you're going to have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. See, I think our problem sometimes is is we think we follow Jesus, he's going to make everything better, you know, he's the prince of peace. But Jesus didn't promise that following him would mean the absence of conflict. It does mean peace, but here's the thing, peace isn't found in the absence of conflict. Peace is found in changing how you approach conflict. It's changing conflict the way that Jesus approaches it. And Jesus' approach overcomes. And he wants you to have that peace. But in order to do that, you got to learn to follow. you got to learn to look at the master of conflict and learn from him. But do you do that? Ask yourself right now. You know how you approach conflict or your family does. Have you learned from Jesus? Do you take any cues from him in how you approach conflict in your life? See, that's what this message is all about. And we're going to learn from Jesus as the conflict master. And this may be cheesy to you, but I like it because it sticks in my head, all right? And when I get in conflicts, for some reason, this pops in my head, and I remind, I need to be like Jesus. He is the judo master. We are going to learn Jesus judo today. Now, judo, you may be interested to find out in Japanese, is the gentle way. That's what it means. And I think that, that's fitting because Jesus' approach to conflict is just different. And today, I want you to learn Jesus Judo. I want to learn a little bit more Jesus Judo too, okay? And so let's start out. Let's just pray, and let's ask him to teach us. Would you pray with me? Jesus, um, I have uh, approached conflict in a lot of different ways in my life, <laughs> and not all of them have been the right way. And I know that's uh, true for, for the people in this room too. Jesus, I pray that you'll help us to see the difference in the way that we approach conflict and the way you approach it. Jesus, teach us all something new today. Teach me something that I can apply to my life. Teach teach everyone here something that they can apply to their life that makes their life better. Jesus, help us to learn how to experience conflict and experience your peace through the way that we approach conflict. Jesus, teach us. In your name that I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So this is the first passage that we're going to look at. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along with us, um, or you're welcome to just look at it on the screen. But this is in Matthew chapter 5, and Jesus is teaching about conflict, as he often did. And this is what he says. He says, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. And isn't it true? A lot of times when we get into a conflict, it turns into, what do I need to do to even the score, right? What do I need to do? Eye for an eye. I've been wronged. Something needs to be done about it. Boom. And we just sometimes act. And sometimes we act just on emotion. We just say stuff. And Jesus is about to show us a different way. But in order to do the Jesus judo in this passage, right, you got to think far past your first emotion. Your first emotion is just eye for an eye or tooth for a tooth. And he's saying, you've heard it said that. You've experienced that. You guys get this. But in order to understand what I'm about to tell you, you got to think past just your first emotion. So that's the first thing. Jesus Judo just does that. Learn to, if you just say, okay, when I get in a conflict, i got to think past my first emotion, you'd be mad and amazed what it can do. But if you apply this other stuff, man, it'll even take you further. Because Jesus goes on to describe. This is how 
He gives us this example of what it's like to do some Jesus judo and think past your first emotion. He says this, If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat. If anyone forces you to go a mile, go with them two miles. Give to the one who asks you. Don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Now, at first glance, this kind of looks like, oh, someone does something to you, and just take it. In fact, give them more. Someone robs you, give them more. <laughs> but when you really look at this, what Jesus says is so clever. And again, this is Jesus' judo. It kind of takes what's coming your way, and it's, a, it's this way of kind of flipping it around. But you don't flip it around just to get even. That's not the purpose of this. But it does flip it around. See, in Jesus' culture, they use their right hand was primary. It was the hand that you'd shake with. Like, it's the hand. It was your social hand. Your left hand is your unsocial hand. It's your dirty business hand, okay? You don't touch people with this hand. If you do, so if someone punches you with this hand, you just turn your other cheek, and then they have to hit you with this hand. If they touch you with this hand, they look like, right? Interesting what Jesus is saying. In Jesus' culture, the undergarment, if you took the undergarment, I mean, it's obviously, it's still stealing. It's not a big deal. It's not, it's not nice to do. But if you took their outer garment, that was, the, most people only had one outer garment. They had multiple undergarments, but only had one. That was how they protected themselves from the elements. If you take their outer garment, what kind of a person are you? You're a terror. Like, you, it's, it's a way of kind of turning it back. It, it, it exposes them for who they are, but without just fighting back. Jesus says that if someone forces you to own mile, and in Roman culture, uh, a centurion or whatever, they could say, hey, you got to carry my armor. A Roman soldier could say, you got to carry my armor for a mile. They could do that, Roman law, but they couldn't do it for two. <laughs> so if you went the extra mile, they would get in trouble. This is Jesus' judo, all right? This is good stuff. This is thinking far past your first emotion, but it requires you to be shrewd as serpents, but yet still innocent as doves because what jesus goes on to say changes how we're approaching this jesus wants us to change how we think of an enemy jesus says this in, in 43 he says you have heard it said love your neighbor and hate your enemy but i tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you that you may be children of your father in heaven see this goes back to what we were talking about a little bit last week a child kind of imitate their parents. All of you, you've imitated a little bit of your parents and learning how you do conflict. But whenever you do this, you're imitating your father in heaven. You're learning conflict from him. But the way he approaches conflict is whenever this wrong has been done, he doesn't look at the enemies the same way we do. We've heard it said, hate your enemy. But Jesus says, no, no, no. I want you to love your enemies. And I want you to pray for them. I, I think he says that because for me anyways, I can say I love my enemy, but it's not that easy to do. I don't just say, oh, I'm going to love my enemy, and then all of a sudden I start loving them. It's in the prayer that the process happens that helps me to love my enemy. See, the difference between loving and hating your enemy, when you love your enemy, you still want what's best for them. You still want what's best for them. And in the process of prayer, that's how I get there. Without the prayer, most of the time, I don't get there. I'm eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But Jesus is wanting us in our way that we approach conflict to change the way that we see our adversary, our enemy. See, Jesus' judo requires you to change how you view your enemies. I want to keep going with this further because I really want us to, to, to learn from Jesus. There's this other passage where Jesus says this. He says, I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, Anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, is answerable to the court. Anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Now, this goes back to thinking past our first emotion. Our gut instinct is eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. When we get angry, sometimes words just come out of our mouths. Here's a good example. I don't know. You, you guys are probably better than me. You never do this. When somebody cuts you off in traffic, what happens? I think this is right, so, right? Because no one's watching, right? So you just let it fly. <laughs> See, our anger sometimes influences our words, right? Because sometimes the way you approach this isn't Jesus judo. It's not the way he sees his enemies. We just let it fly. Now, what Jesus isn't saying, he's not saying just don't be angry. If, you, if you're angry, you're a sinner. No, he's saying 
you are responsible, you are accountable for what you do in your anger. When someone wrongs you and you respond, you're held accountable for that. There's judgments for that. It matters. Your words matter. How you express your anger matters. Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says this, Be angry, but do not sin. It doesn't say don't be angry. Be angry, but learn how to do it and not sin. Don't let the sun go down in your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. See, when we're angry and we just let it go, we give opportunity. <laughs> we give opportunity for what? The conflict a lot of times just gets worse. But when you're able to think past your first emotion and you realize that you're responsible for the words that you say, you can send different words out of your mouth. You can approach it a different way. But you've got to cut yourself. Be angry. See, that's the thing. Jesus is going on to say, because sometimes we think, oh, yeah, well, then I'll just stuff it. I'll be angry, and then I just won't do anything about it. That is not what Jesus is saying. Look at what he follows this up with. He says, therefore, if you have uh, a gift, if you are offering a gift at the altar, and remember that your brother or sister has something against you, or you have something against your brother or sister, in fact, this is so important, I want you to do something about it so much so that I would rather you leave your gift there in front of the altar and first go and be reconciled to them and then come and offer your gift. Whew, that's kind of, like Jesus cares so much about this. He says, oh, you're on your way to church and um, you got some anger that's boiling up inside you. Against him. He would rather you not come here and give your gift. <laughs> He'd rather you go deal with that first because that's how much this matters. This is a priority. It's not saying don't be angry. Being angry is a correct response whenever you get wrong, but there's a way to be angry and not sin. But you've got to learn from him. He's the master when it comes to this. So we see in this verse, though, that, that it's got to be a priority. You've got to do something about it. But we also see in this verse some of the purpose behind why he wants us to do something about it. See, the purpose whenever we do conflict a lot of times is get even. But with Jesus judo, the purpose isn't get even. The purpose is always reconciliation. See, in Jesus judo, reconciliation comes first, requires action. Don't wait. Requires action. Here's what reconciliation is. Reconciliation is an accounting term, right? You reconcile accounts. It means that whenever a debit has been taken on this side, something must be added to make up for the debit, otherwise they don't balance. Whenever a wrong is committed, there is a debit that has been <laughs> made, and something has to replace that debit. And the way Jesus works, his economy, is forgiveness is how you replace that debit. It's what balances the count. But this reconciliation, this process, it takes some work. When you get angry, it's because something has been taken out of the account. But Jesus wants you to go do something about that because unless you do something about that, it's still there. It's still gone. It's still out of the account. And, and Jesus is even reminding us, this has the potential to get in the way of your worship. This is actually something that you see over and over in the Bible. Our thoughts and what we hold on to against others we start to believe that God holds that also in the same way against us. That what is the way that you believe people respond to you, the way that you respond to others, is also affects our relationship and how we view God. And that's why this is so important, because it impacts our worship. He wants you to reconcile. Because why? Because he first reconciled with you. It's his example. He is the master at this, and that is the way he approaches conflict. And if you approach conflict in this way, it will transform you. But it is not easy because it requires a great deal of humility. <laughs> great deal is not easy. See, that, that's the next thing. In Jesus Judo, resolving conflict requires humility. It's not about being right. <laughs> It requires, it's not about being right. I love this verse in Philippians. It's one of my favorite verses. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. I love this verse because without it, I don't think I would know what humility means. I think I would think of humility as just not looking after yourself. And that's not what this verse says. This verse says that it's, it's you look after your own interests, but not only your own interests. 
you got to be able to hold on to your interests while at the same time looking out for the interests of others. you got to be able to hold on to both at the same time. That is what true humility looks like. True humility is to be able to hold on to your interests, your pain, your anger, but don't sin, but also be able to look out for their interests in the middle of the conflict. That is not easy to do, but it's possible. And there's one last passage that I want, there are so many passages that we could look at. Jesus talked about conflict and how we approach it so often. But I love this one because it's really practical and I think it helps us see a practical way that we can behave or act out in a way that shows humility in how we approach conflict. So here it is. Jesus, Judo, resolving conflict requires humility. Here's an example. It says this, if your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you've won them over. See, when you, you resolve conflict the humble way, practically here's what this looks like. It looks like the first step is talking to somebody one-on-one. One-on-one. Now, you might be thinking, well, Justin, how does this, how does this require humility? What, what is the, where is the humility in this? Okay, what do we often do? Oftentimes, somebody wrongs us, and I've seen this. We've seen it here at the church. I've seen this at work. I've seen this at, in a lot of different places. But somebody gets wrong, and what do they do? They go and they talk to everybody they know <laughs> about what they've been wronged and how they've been wronged, and we seek validation because it's about us being right. It's not about holding on to us being right and them being right. There's not two perspectives in it at all. But whenever you go and you talk to the other person, it helps you balance it, doesn't it? It helps you. It gives a chance for you to present your perspective, but also for you to embrace and hear their perspective. It requires great humility to do this. It's hard. That's why a lot of times we avoid it. It's a, it's a lot easier to just go get a bunch of people who will tell you you're right. <laughs> but the thing is, is when you go and talk, I can't tell you how many times, and again, this speaks to my failings, but sometimes I'll be really frustrated with somebody, but I'll know, Jesus Judo. Justin, you got to do Jesus Judo here. I'll remind myself, okay, that means i got to go talk to him, and i got to talk to him, and I, I state my perspective, but then I hear their perspective, and I realize it's just one big giant miscommunication. <laughs> It gives us the opportunity to realize that. Don't think you got it all figured out. This is step one. The way you resolve conflict humbly is that you go and you approach conflict privately, one-to-one. Step one. But it doesn't always work. Jesus knows that. So Jesus says this. But if they will not listen, so that you go, you try and talk, it doesn't work, it's frustrating, been there, then you take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Two or three, okay? One or two, two or three. This is not, all right, bring your gang. Call your gang, get your golf clubs and your club. Let's go beat them down. Like, th- that's not what this is. This isn't the, the tribunal, right? Sometimes we think about the way, but that's not what Jesus is saying here. Jesus is actually helping us to see how to continue in, when it's not going our way in a way that is humble where we realize that, that maybe in this situation, the, the, the perspective of one and another person, that's just not getting us there. Maybe we need to add in a third person's perspective, or maybe even a fourth person's perspective, not five or six. Jesus is being very intentional here, but sometimes we need to go and we need to get somebody else, maybe a counselor, a mediator, maybe call a pastor or somebody in the church that you trust or somebody else at work that you trust, but you bring somebody else in. Why? Because it demonstrates, again, not that it's about you being right, but, but that sometimes it takes multiple perspectives to embrace this idea of humility about many people's perspectives. And, and we need multiple witnesses. And so that's just what Jesus tells us to do. We start one-on-one, then we add a few more into the mix, but sometimes that doesn't work. What then? Well, then you can hate them and attack them, right? No, that's not what Jesus says. He goes on further. He says, if they still refuse to listen, then you tell to the church. You, you bring it out within the community. And if even they listen to the church, again, this is it's almost like third and fourth step in this one. You, you, you bring other people in. This isn't just give up easy. So often that's what we do. We get in a conflict. It isn't going on our way. You know what? Forget them. They'll go that way. I'll go this way. We're done, <laughs> 
So now we bring it to the church. And, and if even that doesn't work, well, then we treat them like a pagan or a tax collector. And this is where we bring this full circle. That doesn't mean that you hate them. <laughs> and Jesus even says, love your enemies. It doesn't mean you stop loving them, but you don't love your enemies the same way that you love your friends. Why? Because you can't. Because they haven't allowed that for you. Jesus isn't saying just keep putting yourself in harm's way. But he is saying don't give up. But there's a way to give, not give up and not put yourself in harm. you got to figure that out. That's the, the third thing, see? Jesus' judo requires us to approach conflict humbly, to, 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 to approach it privately, one-on-one, -on -one, to lean into others when you need help, not to just give up, but also not to put yourself in harm. This is what humility looks like. And so, do you want to follow Jesus in the way that you approach conflict? I mean, that's what all this boils down to. You can listen to all this and walk home and not apply any of it. I mean, even at the end of this little passage here about conflict uh, and it escalating from one to two, to Jesus says, man, this matters. And he, as if he had, we haven't stressed that enough today, but he even goes so far as to say, the way that you approach conflict on earth, it echoes in eternity. What you lose on earth, it has eternal significance. Your approach to reconciliation with others will affect your ability to understand how God reconciles with you. This is so much bigger than you realize. So, are you willing to look to Jesus as the judo master of conflict and learn from him? Now, anybody who's ever learned martial arts knows that you don't learn it all at once. Okay? So here's how I want you to apply this. I'm going to list this back up again. I want you to pick one, maybe two things that you say, I can grow in that area. I want to focus on that. So here's the first one. Think far past your first emotion. Maybe that's where you struggle. Your emotions, they get you, and you let it rip. Maybe you need to change how you view your enemies. Maybe you need to spend some more disciplined time in prayer for people that you know are against you. Allow that process to be at work. Reconciliation and forgiveness, they, they come first. They come first, and they require action. Maybe you're somebody who you constantly stuff, <laughs> and you don't act on your anger, and you need to learn how to act on it in a way that draws people together. Or lastly, maybe you need to just learn how to approach things with humility, how it's not all about being right, growing in and approaching people privately, one-on-one, -on -one, or, or leaning into others. Whatever one of those that stands out to you that you need to focus on, focus on it. Pick something, but don't walk away from here and say, oh yeah, I want to follow Jesus, but not actively do it. Pick a way that you can actively look at Jesus, the conflict master, and to try to put what you learn from him into practice in your life. We're going to finish right now with, with communion, and the band's going to come up in a second uh, when I'm praying. And uh, I want to give you a chance to, 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 to think through this, to tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, here's how I want to learn from you. Here's how I want to grow from you. Jesus went to such great effort. He laid down his life to reconcile with you. He paid such a great price, and he wants you to be able to do that with others following his example. So would you pray with me? And we're going to take communion, and we're going to close out the service. Jesus, thank you for your example. God, help us not to just be um, Christians by name only, just fans. Uh, God, it's when we put this into practice that it changes our lives. And it, and it makes our families uh, different places. God, it changes the way that we approach our spouse, our marriages. It changes the way we approach our work colleagues. God, this gives us opportunities to be such a great example in this city for you. And I just pray that um, you'd give us the courage to put this into practice. And, and God, I was reminded that, man, there's some things that are just deep pains, and sometimes it hurts. It's so hard to put this into practice. But Jesus, give us the courage to put this into practice in our lives. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen.